Today I'm going to give a presentation for some reason silly titled around the file in 80 keys. I'm actually not going to go over 80 different keys you can use to navigate in Vim. I'm just going to go over a few. Might not even be 80 keystrokes in the presentation itself. But I thought it was cute. But first, I wanted to actually say thank you to all of you who actually have come tonight. Um, it's the first meeting of this kind that I set. And um, I hope that it's you know, educational uh, or entertaining or worthwhile. But if uh, there are any suggestions you have, uh, comments, um, particularly my favorite thing that you could offer is to maybe give a talk in the future. Um, I will probably do a default talk if nobody else offers one up. But, um, so I imagine that might get a little boring if you just kind of keep hearing me talk. So please submit a talk. Um, and me, my name is uh, Stephen Belcher. I've, I believe I've probably told all of you already, but in case I didn't, I'm a programmer at the National Institute on Aging, which is a government agency. Uh, and it's got an office over at the Bayview campus of Johns Hopkins. Um, even though it's a government agency, I'm not a government employee, I'm a contractor. Uh, I work for Kelly Government Solutions or Kelly Services. They've got like two or three different names they go by. Um, and I spend probably more of my life than is healthy thinking about different things with regards to Vim, rewriting my configuration files, learning new plugins, installing new plugins, cursing when they uh, screw up my entire environment, that sort of thing. Um, or sometimes thinking they're really awesome. But in any case, I like them a lot. Um, and this photo was actually taken about 35 seconds before I clocked myself in the back of the head with, I think, this one of those. Uh, these are poi, and I don't use them anymore. <laughs> uh, so my hope is that uh, what we've got uh, in the audience is probably going to be some technical or hopefully technical people, people who want to become technical. So we'll generally be um, programmers or system administrators or even people who just do front-end design with CSS or HTML, because uh, these are all text-based things. But another text-based group that sometimes people don't think of as possible targets for using Vim as writers, because of course they're you know, spending a lot of their time working with text, and they could actually benefit from this. But the one thing you probably shouldn't be if you want to use Vim is afraid to use the computer. Uh, some people are actually, you know, kind of nervous when they sit down in front of a computer and are worried they're going to break everything. You kind of have to be a little bit, uh, you know, willing to go at it with gusto. At the very least, you probably shouldn't be scared to, you know, get into the command line because by default, Vim uses the command line a lot. But there is actually a graphical version, so if you're not super comfortable with the command line yet, you don't necessarily have to uh, uh, count yourself out of the possible target audience either. And so this is uh, a very unreadable, because it's so tiny, window of Vim here. This is my personal setup. Um, and as you can see, it's just entirely text-based, and it is what they call a modal text editor which means it's, you know, you don't just open it up like Notepad and start writing. You just open it up and start hitting some characters, you might get some really odd behaviors. And you have to enter the correct mode. And there are multiple platforms that support, that have support for Vim. It's not just Linux, it's not just FreeBSD, any of those things, uh, you know, server systems or anything. There's also Windows versions and Mac OS 10 versions that are, uh, as I said earlier, um, graphical. Um, and, and like I said, it is, it is command line based. So normally, when you first, like for instance here, this is just running inside of a terminal window. So there's no excess, there's no buttons or anything to work with by default. The graphical version includes a few menus and other things and automatic mouse integration, which might make it easier for certain people. But by and large, it's pretty much the same between the two versions. It's just whether or not you have to invoke some command on the command line to start it up versus clicking on an icon. So this talk, as you might have figured out by the fact that I, in a Vim user group, was just saying what even is Vim, is going to be pretty beginner level. So I don't know how uh, 
familiar everybody is with it, but there may be some things that I cover, such as just general Vim motion idioms, which you may already know if you're an intermediate to advanced Vim user already. Um, and then I will just cover a few general purpose Vim motion commands. These are going to be commands that should be workable regardless of the language you happen to be using at the time. Some of these, some Vim commands are better for certain languages than others. So I'm just going to kind of give some ones that should be good in general. And part of the reason I don't want to go over too many of the commands right now is because there's so many of them that if I actually tried to go over all of them, then you know there would be too many to remember at once. And just be such a mountain of information that you know it would almost be better not giving a talk. But there is inline help inside of Vim. If you've ever run Vim, you know you uh, have will quite quite frequently run across the colon wq command to save and exit, or just colon w. Uh, so you can run other commands, and one of them is an inline help command. This help motion dot text will actually open up the uh, motion command uh, help. And so my hope is that at the end of this talk, if you didn't weren't able to understand it already, that this should give a much better base for learning in the future. And I'm going to try to go relatively slowly, but if uh, if I'm going too quickly at any particular point, or if I'm mumbling or whatever, you know, you can feel free to just sort of raise your hand and just be like, hey, you know, please stop. I didn't quite catch that. So as far as how this talk will go, I will have a terminal window on the right like you saw earlier. Um, so this will just be where the effects of the motion commands that I'm showing off will be. But because the motion commands are generally single character commands that are like letters or arrow keys or something like that, uh, you might not necessarily know what characters are being pressed at what time. So over here will be where I will display the characters that are being pressed at a given point. So for example, this is just me typing a few characters into the terminal. And as you can see, the space character doesn't necessarily have an immediately obvious visual effect like typing space could be either actually putting in a space or it could be moving over one character. So here it's clarifying what's happening there. And uh, you know we finish out the command and then we push enter, which again is a character that doesn't have an immediate visual effect, but you know it does have an effect. So you know this helps demonstrate what's being done. So that's enough setup that hopefully you'll be able to follow the rest of the talk. So let's just launch into the actual motion commands. So the most immediate and obvious one is, of course, arrow keys. When you open up a text file in bin, you can just push the arrow keys, you know, down arrow a bunch of times and then up, and it'll just move your cursor up and down in the file. And that's pretty obvious. There are other commands you can use to just move up and down, but the arrow keys are a good mainstay because if you enter insert mode, for instance, you can still use the arrow keys, whereas the replacements for the arrow keys are not necessarily, are, are generally uh, letters. Um, they don't, if you actually typed those letters when you're in insert mode, of course those letters would show up in your file. They wouldn't move you around anymore whereas the arrow keys will actually continue to move you in the same way that they always have. They're pretty consistent, so they're a pretty solid motion command. But that's just a general text editor thing. Like all text editors, you're used to being able to move around with the arrow keys. So what makes Vim kind of cool is that you can actually prefix any one of those commands, like typing a, a down arrow with a number, and it will actually behave as though you press that key that number of times. So when you say, you know, when I, for instance, just then typed seven, you know, nothing happened yet, but when I pushed the down arrow, it actually moved me down seven whole lines. And it didn't step through that at all, it just did it as though I just went down seven whole lines. And this isn't just limited, I always say this. Um, one thing you might notice is that I actually have the line numbers turned on. Vim doesn't usually have these turned turned on by default, but I find that's a lot easier, particularly because I use these sort of uh, 
number-based motion commands a lot, it's easier to move between all the various lines. So this is another thing that Vim does, which is cool. You can configure it a lot based on you know your personal preferences. You can see this version of Vim is a lot different looking than the one I had before. So there's a lot of configuration you can do, and this is one that I highly recommend um, is turning on the line number. So aside from just moving up and down, though, you can, uh, for instance, what I just typed was 2-3. So that's 23, and then I press the right arrow. And this is actually the 24th character in the line. So I was able to jump over 20, 23 whole characters without necessarily uh, having to sit there and hammer on the right arrow key. Although, in this particular instance, it's not as handy because there's no column numbers. So I would have had to sit there if I wanted to get over to the seven and count all those characters. And by that point, it would just be easier, of course, to actually hit the right arrow key than try to be smart and you know minimize my keystrokes. But I can tell that it is the fourth word on that line, right? So this is where the more advanced Vim motion commands come into play. And this is where we start having letter-based motion commands that we can use. So there's a capital W letter that you can type, and that will actually move you forward an entire word every time. And there's also a capital V command, which will move you back a word every time you type it. And you can think of these sort of, and you can try to remember them that way, which is you know, uh, w for word, b for back. That's kind of how I arrange it in my brain. Anyway, whatever way might work for you. But you can also use those number commands, which we just saw again. We just went down seven lines. But we can also decide we, we're on the first word here, and we want to move to the fourth word in the line, which is where that four is. So we can actually type three, and then the w command, and that actually moves our cursor all the way to the fourth word on the line. So that becomes a lot easier. Then we don't actually do, we don't have to count the number of characters, nor do we have to sit there hammering on the arrow keys until we happen to get to the word we want. And you may have heard I made specific care to say capital W and capital B. If you actually just did a lowercase w and a lowercase b, you'll notice that when I say forward and backward a, a word with lowercase letters, it's actually smaller units. So you can, again, sort of think of it, and try to remember it that way if you would like, but it is important to remember because the capital W and capital B move based on spaces and what's not a space, whereas the lowercase w and the lowercase b move based on words that are counted as um, with like punctuation involved as well. So in this particular case, the quotation marks sort of counted as being effectively a different word. So, but the big takeaway here is not necessarily to try and remember the difference between, you know, what's a word and what's not a word to a lowercase w and b, as much as it is to remember that Vim is case sensitive with these motion commands. So there's one other way you can, well, there, there are more than one other way, but <laughs> there's one other way that I frequently use to move to specific characters. So say, for instance, the seven that we wanted to jump to earlier wasn't actually just a word, but it was actually somewhere in the middle of the word, but we didn't want to change it or do something with it. So if we're on that line, this fifth line down, and we want to get to the seven, well, we could just type uh, you know, W and get over one word and then an arrow character to get to the seven. But what if it were like buried further in the line? And then we would have to figure out how many words in it is or whatever other information we might need to sort of jump to it. Or we could use this F command, which you can think of to jump forward to a character, and type seven afterwards, and that will actually move us forward to the first occurrence of that seven in the line, or first occurrence after where our current cursor is. For instance, if I wanted to move to the B right in front of it, I couldn't type FB with a lowercase f, but I can because there's a related motion command, a capital F and a B, and that should have been a B there. Sorry, that was not a B, that was a seven. <coughs> but imagine, use your imagination powers, that it, was, uh, that it was a B, and that jumped us back to the B that was just before it. So 
F with a lowercase moves you forward, F with an uppercase moves you backward. And I don't have an actual example of this written up, but you can also use uh, the numbers with these commands as well. So if there were, for instance, three sevens on that line that we wanted to uh, work with, but we only wanted to work with the third one, we could actually type three F seven, and that would jump us to the third seven on that line where it happened to be assuming our first was Question. Yes. It, it is line restricted. So you couldn't do two F seven and get to the second seven on the next uh, line? Not with the F command. Uh, one of the other. Yeah, so it is, li it is line restricted, yes. The short answer to your question is yes, it is line restricted. Um, there, are, there are other ways you can get to that next seven, but um, not with, nothing uh, quite that short, I should say. So you can jump to specific characters on, the, on a given line, but if you want to jump to a specific line, for instance, say you're somewhere buried deep in the file, and you run some script and it comes back and it says, hey, there's an error on line 52 and you want to jump to line 52, but you don't want to necessarily calculate the difference between where you are and line 52. You just want to go straight there. You can actually use the capital G command. So for instance here, if we want to go to line 10 in this file, we would type 10 and then a capital G. Um, this, uh, this is kind of a different style of motion command. And I just wanted to use this to sort of illustrate that you know not every single motion command is just necessarily done where you can just repeat the command uh, in the in the repeat the command idiom. Because of course if you just type G by itself, the G by itself, the capital G by itself, will actually take you to the bottom line of the file. Now if you said, okay, take me to the bottom line of the file ten times, well, you know, of course you would just assume you're gonna wind up at the bottom of the file no matter how many times you run that command. So in this particular context, putting a number in front of this command actually changed what it did. So there are some times when that is the case. So that's you know, important to also remember. And sometimes, you know, if, I, if I, I, I use that G command all the time. But sometimes, for instance, I'm somewhere in the middle of the file, and this is Sometimes how Vim is set up where there are no line numbers. And I forget to say, type in the number before I hit that capital G. So that jumps me all the way to the bottom of the file. And I have no idea where I just was. Now, in this particular case, I knew where I was because I was right at the top of the file. But say I don't. Say I was somewhere in the middle of the file and I don't, I don't want to necessarily have to go hunting for where I was. There's actually a quick way to, if you want to consider this, undo that last jump, which is to type two apostrophes, and that will actually jump us back to where we were at the last jump point. So, in summary, uh, you know, I would, I personally don't use the arrow keys all that much, but if I don't necessarily look down at anybody who does because they are actually pretty solid for uh, using uh, during multiple modes of operation, so it doesn't necessarily have to occupy any additional headspace, and it's you know a pretty good solid reason for using them. Um, in uh, and then of course in the normal mode for most motion commands, you can prefix those motion commands with numbers to make them you know move you multiple multiple times faster than you would otherwise move. And motion command keys are, of course, case sensitive. And the command keys we looked at were the W and B commands to move forward and backward words, and the F key, the F upper and lowercase to move backwards and forwards on a line to specific characters, the G command, which can alternately move you to the bottom of the file or to a specific line in the file, depending on whether you give it a number, and the double apostrophe, which will uh, take you back to the previous jump point. So again, hopefully this has just given you enough of a sort of general idea for Vim Motion that you can then take and learn some more, a little bit more easily. With Vim, there is an 
a built-in command called vimtutor. This is a, another command line utility that you can use. Uh, if you just open it up, it actually walks you through a file uh, for, you can, you can open it up and then just edit files. It tells you, okay, now run this command and now, and now run this command so that you can sort of slowly, you know, take in all the different ways you can move around a file and edit it. And again, as I said earlier, there is built-in uh, documentation. So with the help command, you can uh, read a fairly comprehensive list of all of the various motion commands that you can use in the motion.txt help file. And then there's some online resources that I think are pretty cool. The coolest is the Vim Adventures website, which is actually kind of like a little uh, role-playing game of sorts. But it actually, um, it actually teaches you how to use Vim commands. So you, you know, you go on basically quests, and you know you're controlling the cursor to go and find various things. And it teaches you over time to use more and more increasingly elaborate um, commands. This uh, there is an intro level which should basically cover all of the commands I just went over. Um, uh, if you want to get into more advanced levels, it is not free forever. And then there's this openvim.com. If, uh, for instance, you don't want your boss to come by and think you're playing video games all day, this is a little bit better. It's actually just a pretty much straight up tutorial, but it is also interactive and online, and it works through teaching you various commands to use with Vim. So, that's very everything I got today. Are there any questions or anything? The double single quote, is that a general purpose uh, undo? You can use it on the other commands as well, or just, just that G command? Uh, there is a limited list of commands it can undo. I don't think any of the ones I just showed, because uh, it is a line-wise thing, and most of the commands I showed were like internal to a specific line. So the, um, the double apostrophe will actually take you back to the last place you were at before you issued a sort of a jump command, if you will. Even actually, I believe the arrow keys are not considered jump commands, even when you do give them a number in advance. So um, it's, it's, it's a fairly limited list. And the most frequent place I find myself using it is when I screw up with one of those G commands. The other way you can screw up with that G command is also uh, typing the wrong number, like or leaving off a digit or something, and winding up in the completely wrong section of the file. So yeah, that's that's just generally where I've used it. But yeah, for for all the other commands that I showed today, it wouldn't really be useful. Okay, I think we're probably good. Awesome. <laughs> so um, we've got about, I think, ten more minutes. Um, I don't know if anybody had any other just general questions, not about um, the presentation in particular, but just about anything in VM or what have you, um, or just general chat. So I was trying to like follow along and while you were doing it to like type in, mm -hmm. and um, I really got stuck on the F, the, um, the capital F and the lowercase F, because mm -hmm. I for some reason like I kept thinking what you were saying was that it would move you three, three spaces forward or three characters forward, but it was like searching for the number and the string. I was like I can't and I was never getting. It. I was like, what the heck is going on? And then yeah, so. I like looked again. I was like oh. <laughs> Yeah, and then I, it worked a lot better, like because I need to put a number in my my string. Yeah, I would. I uh, I I was feeling like perhaps I should have used a different uh, character to search for than a number. Uh, cause oh, does it work with other characters too? Yeah. Well, that's when I was in the presentation. Like the other thing I was looking for was a B. I was too busy in here trying to like yeah. make it work. Yeah. No, actually, uh, it, so. it it will work with any uh, printable character. I think or any character you can type on your keyboard. But which one moves backwards? The capital F. Oh, okay, okay. 